Well, it's wonderful to welcome you who are viewing on Zoom. And although you're not here with us, we believe that you're very much part with us today as part of the body of Christ. We're the Lord's people together, and that's terribly exciting, isn't it? So we have so much to look forward to. That's why I'm grateful that um, we started with that lovely song of Stuart Townend. It's a, a message full of hope. I always remember David Pawson once saying that these three abide, you remember Paul's writing, these three abide, faith, hope, and love, and the most neglected of these is hope. And that's true, you know, because particularly today, many, many people are utterly hopeless. They have no hope, no hope in Jesus, no belief in Jesus, no trust in Jesus, no confidence in Jesus. And so there is nothing to raise their eyes, and they're full of fear and apprehension, and it's tragic. But you see, we're not like that, are we? Because we know who we have believed, and we have believed the word of Jesus. We have believed the gospel of the kingdom, and we're living in the reality of that gospel. And so that gives us tremendous hope. So while the world around us is absolutely struggling, we acknowledge that so many millions of them are actually longing for truth, and yet the truth is being kept from them. And it's terribly, terribly sad, but you and I have an opportunity, an opportunity that I don't believe has been afforded for many, many years, because people are so desperate, they are willing to listen to what we have to say, but the only fly in the ointment is, are we prepared to say it? And that really is a challenge that I want to bring to you today. A title that I selected for today was Life with the Lions. You may, some of you, remember many, many years ago, and I can only just remember it, so it must be at least, uh, it must be about 95 years old. But I can just remember the light program. Do you remember that, any of you, on the wireless, as we used to call it? Yes. And um, one of the programs was called Life with the Lions. And it was about a family, a, a, an American family. There was Ben Lyon and there was his wife who was called B.B. And they had two children, uh, Richard and Barbara. You see, I can remember those dim, distant days. And it was quite a fun program. But it, it just came back into my mind when I was thinking about today. And I felt, yeah, that's not a bad little title because of course, it has a different meaning for us. We're aware that we're living in a pagan culture. And for us, we are surrounded by all kinds of forces which seek to discourage us and to destroy our testimony. And much as Daniel, when he was in Babylon, we find ourselves in that alien culture, forced to cope with it. But at the same time, it's a tremendous opportunity for us to display the righteousness of God. That's what Daniel did. He was an incredible figure, wasn't he? And you'll remember one of the most famous incidents in the Scriptures is Daniel being thrown into the den of lions. What an uncomfortable feeling it must have been. It must have been terrifying for him. But the Lord was with him, and he shut the mouths of the lions. And so we can be encouraged today knowing that the Lord is with us in our life situations, and we don't have to be afraid. Yes, of course, we can be apprehensive. There's nothing wrong with that, because we see so many dreadful things occurring. But over all and undergirding all is our vibrant hope. Jesus is coming for his church, and subsequent to that, we shall be with him forever in the new heaven and the new earth. What a future we have to look forward to. Praise the Lord. So I want to speak into that situation about the way we cope with everything seemingly turning against the Lord and in consequence turning against us. And who knows what lies in store? One person does and he's made every provision for us and his name is Jesus. Hallelujah. I'd like you to turn with me, please, to the 24th chapter of Matthew. Well, there's a surprise. You wouldn't have expected that, would you? Speaking about the, the end times, who'd have thought Matthew 24? Well, of course, Matthew 24 is a classic chapter in the Gospels. 
Jesus is speaking, and he's speaking to his disciples, his beloved. And Matthew 24 begins like this. We're going to take it down to verse 14. Jesus left the temple and was walking away when his disciples came up to him to call his attention to its buildings. Do you see all these things, he said? I tell you the truth, not one stone here will be left on another. Every one will be torn or thrown down. As Jesus was sitting on the Mount of Olives, the disciples came to him privately. Tell us, they said, when will this happen and what will be the sign of your coming and of the end of the world or the end of the age? Jesus answered, watch out that no one deceives you. For many will come in my name claiming, I am Messiah, and they will deceive many. You'll hear of wars and rumors of wars, but see to it that you're not alarmed. Such things must happen, but the end is still to come. Nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. There will be famines and earthquakes in various places. All these are the beginning of birth pains. Then you will be handed over to be persecuted and put to death, and you'll be hated by all nations because of me. At that time, many will turn away from the faith and will betray and hate each other. And many false prophets will appear and deceive many people. Because of the increase of iniquity, of wickedness, the love of most will grow cold. But he who stands firm to the end will be saved. And this gospel of the kingdom will be preached in the whole world as a testimony to all nations, and then the end will come. Now that's the passage I believe the Lord wants me to begin with, at any rate, to use as a jumping off platform. We shall go to another scripture we shall, we, we shall also major on. But I just want to mention this because to my mind it sets the whole scene for what the Lord is wanting to say to us today. But let's start at the beginning. Notice at the beginning of chapter 24, we're in Jerusalem. This is where the action is taking place. And we're told that Jesus left the temple and was walking away when his disciples did something rather interesting. They came up to him and they called his attention to its buildings. That's an extraordinary thing, isn't it, when you look at it? I mean, Matthew has given us the detail here, but you have to wonder what that's about. Why did the disciples call Jesus' attention to the stones of the temple? Now, Lindy and I, and Barry and Carol, have been privileged to take many, many tour groups to Israel. And while there, we've spent time in Jerusalem, obviously, not least looking at the remains of the temple and the massive stones that were used to create the temple, used by Herod the Great in his monumental work. His great work as a builder is what deserved him the title, Herod the Great, is because he was a mighty builder. He's a pretty rotten individual, but he was a greatly gifted architect and builder. And so the temple in Jerusalem is testament to his genius as a builder. So when the disciples were there looking at these enormous stones in the temple, they called Jesus' attention to them. Well, why did they think he'd be particularly interested in this huge building? Anyone any suggestion to make? Because he was a builder. Now that may surprise you, because you're used to hearing the Lord Jesus described as a carpenter. And indeed he was. He was a worker with wood, but he was also a worker with stone. And the word in the Greek language used here is tectone. When you see references to Jesus' trade, the word used is tectone. And that doesn't just mean carpenter, it also means a builder. So Jesus was a builder. He was, after Joseph died, Jesus was clearly the head of a company, a building company in Nazareth, Joseph and Sons, Master Builders of Nazareth. Well, that's the fact. You know, it's good to get a bit of realism into this. And Jesus was a workman who built houses. And that's interesting. 
Because you and I are part of a house that Jesus is building. What did Jesus say according to Matthew 16? I will build my church. He said some remarkable things about buildings because he was genuinely interested in the building trade and in buildings. So when the disciples said to him, look, Lord, at these great buildings, they knew he'd be interested, and I'm sure he was. I often think how wonderful it is that in Capernaum one day, when some friends brought their crippled friend for Jesus to minister to him, remember what they did? The, the meeting was full. They couldn't get into the house. So how did they cope? They ripped the roof off the poor guy's house who'd arranged the meeting. They ripped the roof off and they lowered their friend through the rafters down in front of Jesus. And of course, Jesus healed him, didn't he? It was wonderful, wonderful. But have you ever spared a thought for the owner of the house? Having Jesus speak in his house meant that he lost his roof. Now that's a bit sick. You think, oh dear, I didn't bargain for that. But I love to think that because Jesus was there, he was able to say to the householder, now don't worry, I'm here. And after the meeting's over and the people have gone, I'll come back and I'll mend it with you. Because he was that kind of a person. He was a builder. So this is perfectly natural. And Jesus responds, do you see all these things? I tell you the truth, not one stone here will be left on another. Every one will be thrown down or torn down. Who did that and when? It was done by the Romans. Anybody know when? A.D. 70, indeed it was. And they were very thorough in what they did. They hated the Jewish people at this stage because the Jewish people were uh, revolting and I don't mean that in a nasty way, but that's what they were doing. They were rising up against the Roman authorities. And so it was that um, they were really hated by the Romans. And when they came to Jerusalem to put down that Jewish revolt, they destroyed the temple. Now it's interesting, that who was the person that actually was the general who did that? Titus, Titus good. Anybody know what his father was called? Vespasian. Did somebody say Vespasian? Well, that was his father's name. Vespasian was emperor when Titus came as general to mastermind the destruction of Jerusalem. But Vespasian was an honorable guy, and he knew that the temple in Jerusalem was actually one of the wonders of the ancient world. And the last thing he wanted was to see that destroyed. He wanted the people put down and crushed, but he didn't want the temple destroyed. So he told Titus, his son, that he didn't want that to happen. Unfortunately, however, many of his troops were filled with loathing for the Jews, not least because they were on their way home from different parts of the empire. They were on their way home to Rome when Vespasian diverted them to Judea and they were absolutely at the end of their tether. And by the time they got there, they were murderous and they set fire to the temple building. The temple building was built of limestone and uh, they tell me that if limestone is heated to a certain high temperature, it will actually burn. The stone will burn. And so the conflagration in Jerusalem was absolutely horrendous. Thousands died. The Romans did such a thorough job that not one stone of the temple building itself was left on top of another. Now when you go there today, you will see remains of the temple. So you think, well, hang on a minute. If Matthew says, not one, Jesus said, not one stone will be left on another, how come that there are remains of the temple today that we can actually visit? Well, what you can visit is the temple mount on which the temple stood. But when you go there, there's not one bit of the original temple standing because just as Jesus prophesied, the whole thing was destroyed, burned to the ground, and the dust was just blown away. So nothing is left, just like Jesus said it would be. Amazing. 
but the evidence of the artistry and the magnificent engineering is still there in the huge stones that make up the Temple Mount itself. Some of those pieces of limestone are 45 feet long, 15 feet wide and 15 feet high. Think of that. Many of them all built into the retaining wall on top of which was the platform where the Temple of Herod stood as indeed had the Temple of Solomon before it. So it is an extraordinary place to visit but an extraordinary place to see it featuring in the prophetic ministry of Jesus, preparing the apostles for what was coming. So then they cross over from the Temple Mount. There's a valley to the east of the Temple Mount. Anybody know what it's called? The Kidron Valley. The Kidron Valley. So they cross the Kidron Valley and they go up onto a mountain. What's that called? the Mount of Olives. And that's where Jesus with the disciples used to spend quite a lot of time apparently, not least overnight. It's clear from the Gospels that Jesus was very friendly with a particular family who lived over the top of the Mount of Olives in a small village called Bethany. What were their names? Hmm? Lazarus, Mary and Martha, quite so. And so Jesus was very well used to being on the Mount of Olives, and that's where he went now. Sitting on the Mount of Olives, the disciples came to him privately. It's interesting that Jesus sat down and his disciples came to him. There are a number of occasions in the Gospels where you have that figure of speech. He sat down and his disciples came to him. Any idea why that might be? Why is that significant? Because he was going to teach them. When a rabbi was in a synagogue, he taught sitting down. The rabbis always sat to teach and stood to read the scriptures. Quite an interesting fact. So when we read here, Jesus was sitting on the Mount of Olives and the disciples came to him. There's more to that than meets the eye, you see, because they knew once he sat down, they should gather round because he was going to tell them something incredibly important. Tell us, they said to Jesus, when will this happen? What you've spoken about, when will this happen? And what will be the sign of your coming and the end of the age, the end of the world? Tremendous three-part question there. When will this happen? Fall of Jerusalem. What will be the sign of your coming and of the end of the age? Three things, it seems. Because there are three things, aren't there? Jerusalem fell in AD 70, a significant date, but also what will be the sign of your coming and of the end of the world? As if those are two separate things, and many of us believe they are. I don't know where you feel, what you feel about this, but we believe that Jesus is coming for his church, what we call the rapture, and then after that will be the end of the world, the end of the age, when Jesus comes to judge and ultimately to set up his kingdom in the earth. When will this happen? They were curious to know. Look at Jesus' reply though, verse 4. There's a word here that recurs four times in the section from verse 4 down to verse 25. And it is the word deceive. Very, very important word for the end days. Deception. Jesus answered, Watch out that no one deceives you. For many will come in my name claiming I'm Messiah. Messiah. Christ we have in our translations. It's the Greek form, Christus, of the Hebrew word Mashiach. And that means, as you know more than most, it means anointed one. Question is, who did they anoint? in Bible days? Kings and priests. So when you come across the word Christ or the Hebrew equivalent Messiah, it's telling you that Jesus is the King of Kings. He is our great High Priest. What a wonderful title for our Saviour. Many will come in my name claiming I am Messiah, the Anointed One, and they will deceive many. There again in verse 11, many false prophets will appear and deceive many people. 
And then again in verse 24, we didn't read as far as this, but there it is. False messiahs, false prophets will appear, perform great signs and miracles to deceive even the elect, if that were possible. So I have told you ahead of time. Now notice that word deceive, deception. It's a really, really important word. And because Jesus repeats it four times, we should take due note of the fact we are in grave danger of deception. And everything has to be filtered through the Scriptures in order for us to receive it as a word from the Lord. But there is a way in which we are to do that. And Jesus refers to it in Matthew chapter 18. There is a very, very important emphasis here. How do we test what we hear? Well, this is Matthew 18 and verse 15. He says, If your brother sins against you, go and show him his fault, just between the two of you. If he listens to you, you've won your brother over. But if he will not listen, take one or two others along, so that every matter may be established by the testimony of two or three witnesses. If he refuses to listen to them, tell it to the church. And if he refuses to listen even to the church, treat him as you would a pagan or a tax collector. That's quite a serious statement, isn't it? But there is an order there that is perfectly clear, and I believe it's important that we keep that order in mind if we have a problem with something we hear from a preacher or whatever. There is a way of approaching it and a way of not approaching it. So if you have a desire to be utterly scriptural, in not only in what you believe but in what you practice, then here is something we need to do. And that's why preachers like myself and Charlie over here and Pastor Charles and others here who are preachers, why we're always insistent that you listen carefully and you weigh what you hear with the Scriptures. Remember those Bereans who Luke describes in Acts who heard the Apostle Paul preach? But they didn't just accept what he said, they checked him out with the Hebrew Scriptures. Now that was an inconvenient thing for them to have to do because they weren't privileged like you. They didn't have a Bible on their knee. They had to go to the synagogue and ask permission from the custodian of the scrolls to ask if they could look at the scrolls of the Hebrew Scriptures to make sure what they'd heard from Paul was kosher. That's quite a, quite a thing to do, isn't it? But they did it, and Luke commends them for it. So, yes, checking out with the Scriptures is what we're required to do. But if there's something which troubles us, then there's a clear line of approach here. First of all, we go to consult that person one-to-one. -one. We don't immediately go scurrying off to kind of form a little group of protest. <laughs> we go one-to-one, -one, and then if we're not received, then we take it wider, and if we're not received again, then it's reported to the church and so forth. But it's important to do things biblically, isn't it? And then we're sure that we're operating as we should. But it's just fascinating to me that this word deceive is used four times. It is critically important that we recognize this in these last days. Now, one of the things we notice is that Jesus speaks about how things are going to be, and it's clear that those who love Jesus, those who are his disciples, are going to have a difficult time. You'll hear of wars and rumors of wars. See to it that you're not alarmed. Well, if ever we lived in a day when we're hearing rumors of warfare and actual warfare, not just rumors, we're in those days. So we know where we are. Such things must happen, but the end is still to come. Nation will rise against nation, kingdom against kingdom. I mean, it really is sort of laying in one layer on top of another to show that this is going to happen. There will be famines and earthquakes in various places. And I think it's Mark, in his equivalent of this, who says there will be pestilences. 
Well, we're familiar with that. Look, look at the awful carnage which has been happening in our society as a result of pestilence, COVID-19 and all the rest of it. But in verse 8, Jesus says, all these are the beginning of birth pains. I'm glad about that, the beginning of birth pains. Birth pains sounds horribly painful to me, but actually it's terribly hopeful. I remember Lindy saying that she'd heard a testimony from an American pastor's wife who was talking about giving birth to one of their children. She was in hospital and she was experiencing the most excruciating agony as these birth pains began to grip her. It was hideous. And as she was nearing the climax of all this, her husband was trying to comfort her, and you know how you do, you husbands, we husbands, patting their hand and stroking their brows and saying, there, there, darling, never mind, it'll soon be over. She wasn't having any of it. She was screaming her head off. And she turned on him and she said, you did this to me. And the poor guy was wilting, you can imagine. Then the next moment, out pops the baby. She turns to her husband and she says, oh darling, how wonderful. When can we have another one? Such a contrast, but that's the point, you see. All these things, Jesus says, are the beginning of birth pains, the pain. But it's leading on to inexpressible joy. So look, we're back to where we started. Hope. We have hope. Jesus is coming for his church. Hallelujah. Jesus is coming for us. Hallelujah. And what exquisite joy we are going to experience. Isn't that wonderful? Let's cling on to that. All these things are the beginning of birth pains. Yes, they're unpleasant. Yes, they're hideously painful. But they are a means to an end. And the end is truly glorious. Hallelujah. It goes on, though, in verse 9. It seems to get worse, doesn't it? Then you'll be handed over to be persecuted and put to death, hated by all nations because of me, because of our fellowship with Jesus, because our relationship with Jesus, because we're born again, because we take the word of Jesus literally and we're, we live in the reality of the word. And people are beginning to hate us. Society is beginning to hate us. There is evidence for it all over. Let's not be fooled. We are going to be facing birth pain, and it is going to be pain. But we must hold on to what the larger vision is. We are going to have unutterable joy. Praise the Lord. And isn't that a wonderful, wonderful thing? But just notice this, because this is sad, and Jesus was, you can imagine him weeping as he said these things, as he looked down the empty corridor of the future and saw these last days in which we live and saw the things that would happen and how so many people would fall away. Verse 10, at that time many will turn away from the faith and will betray and hate each other. Well, we've got to be prepared for that. That's going to be very, very painful. People who call themselves believers now, people who call themselves disciples of Jesus, they will turn back. They weren't disciples in the first place, it seems. They were nominal. They were those that said, yes, we're Christians, we're followers of Jesus. We'll go anywhere with you, Lord Jesus. But when the going got tough, they fell away. And the Lord Jesus speaks about this in verse 12. He says, the love of most will grow cold. Forgive the pun, but that is a chilling statement. Because if love grows cold, what must love have been? What must it have been? If it grows cold, what must it have been? Hot, hot. So those who have a hot love for Jesus now, it's going to be severely tested. And we have to take good account of this. We are going to be tested, and the temptation is going to be to fall away. 
Now, we wouldn't be the first disciples of Jesus to fall away, to fall away from the truth. You'll remember in John's Gospel account in chapter 6, isn't it, when Jesus was speaking some things that they found very, very hard to accept. Well, let's look at it, then you can see I'm not making this up. I'm sure it's John 6. Yes, here we are. Jesus has admittedly been giving them some exceedingly tough stuff. Some doctrine is tough, isn't it? Makes us really wonder. And he'd been talking, <clears throat> and it's recorded by John in chapter 6, verses 25 and following, about him being the bread of life. Oh, hallelujah, what a wonderful thing. But he talks about us needing to feed on him. Now, that's a very difficult concept, isn't it? And you can imagine, because there were Jewish people listening as well as his disciples, and verse 52 says, when Jesus says, if anyone eats of this bread, he'll live forever. This bread is my flesh, which I will give for the life of the world. Now, that's a tough statement. Then the Jews began to argue among themselves sharply. How can this man give us his flesh to eat? Now, you see, that's a troublesome thing logically, isn't it? How could that be? It's a genuine question. But he goes on to explain it. Verse 56, Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood remains in me and I in him. Now, do you think that's simple teaching? I don't think so. I think that's jolly tough. Especially when he's teaching it to his disciples in the presence of these Jewish religious leaders. And then look at verse 60. On hearing it, Many of his disciples said, this is a hard teaching. And the word hard means difficult to receive. It's problematic. This is stretching us beyond the limit. We can't go with this. This is a hard saying. Many of his disciples said, this is a hard saying. Who can accept it? Aware that his disciples were grumbling about this, Jesus said to them, does this offend you? What if you see the Son of Man ascend to where he was before? He doesn't make it simpler. He makes it more difficult for them. The Spirit gives life. The flesh counts for nothing. The words I've spoken to you are spirit and they are life. Yet there are some of you here who do not believe. For Jesus had known from the beginning which of them did not believe and who would betray him. He went on to say, This is why I told you that no one can come to me unless the Father has enabled him. From this time, many of his disciples turned back and no longer followed him. You don't want to leave too, do you? Jesus asked the twelve. Simon Peter answered him, and I find that this is a fascinating reply. And as I was meditating on this, I couldn't help thinking, Lord Jesus, you must have been disappointed when you heard this. Simon Peter answered him when Jesus said, you don't want to leave too, do you? Lord, to whom shall we go? And I read something there. I don't know whether you'll agree with my reading, but I happen to think that when he said, Lord, to whom shall we go? It was a bit like saying, well, if there was somebody else we could go to, we would go. <laughs> but there ain't nobody else. You have the words of eternal life. We believe and know that you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. That's one of the readings of that passage there. But... That's amazing to me. But th there's this reality in it, isn't there? That the teaching of Jesus can sometimes be so hard, so difficult to swallow, so difficult to receive, and particularly so difficult to act upon, that we're almost tempted to say, well, I think I'll retreat into traditional church. That's an easier path. That's not going to get me so many enemies. I'm not going to have so many people criticizing me and wanting to pull me down. Oh no, that would be much easier. There must be a simpler way than this. 
To go the way of Jesus is such a hard way. But you see, it is the only way. And dear old Peter said it. To whom else can we go? You have the words of eternal life. There is nobody else. Look, we're going to have to face tough choices. I can speak to you like I can't speak to people in regular churches because you come to these meetings because you have a degree of maturity. You weigh things for yourself. You know perfectly well that we're disciples of Jesus who are going to face hard times. You know that. I can speak frankly with you. But at the same time, there are times when old smutty face, as Billy Bray used to call Satan, <laughs> sits up on our shoulder and says, you don't really want to have to suffer, do you? You've had it so good for so long. Why not keep it that way? Just, you haven't got to reject Jesus entirely. Just step back from this extreme stuff. Just step back, one little step. You'll be able still to call yourself a Christian. You can still sing your hymns. You can still go to your prayer meetings. But it just means you're no longer so objectionable to so many people. But you see, we have to obey God rather than men. I'd love to be able to say to you, I'd love to be able to preach smooth things to you and say, there, there, all is well. Just don't be so extreme. Don't be so fundamentalist. Just draw back a little bit, only a little bit. But you see, we deprive ourselves of the joy of following Jesus when we do that. We deprive ourselves of the fullness of our experience as disciples of Jesus, we fall back into something which is not much better than religion. And we all know how Jesus treated religion. He hated it. So I believe we have to hear this. We don't want to lose our reward, do we? Well, I'm not suggesting we should lose our salvation. Can't, we can't do that. We have a sovereign God. Jesus has rescued us. He's not going to toss us back into the whirlpool. But we can lose our reward. This is a reality, folks. It's a reality check, perhaps. And we have to be aware of it. But it's tough. It's tough. But that verse 14 is a verse which took me by surprise the other day. I was reading this through and I hadn't honestly taken full account of the meaning of verse 14 because here is a most tremendous positive thing in the midst of all this negativity and this pain and all the rest of it. Listen to this. And this gospel of the kingdom will be preached or proclaimed in the whole world as a testimony to all nations, and then the end will come. And my first thought was, well, Lord, this is promising revival at the end, isn't it? There's going to be a mighty revival. And there are those who say that that is the case. But Jesus didn't say that is the case. This isn't talking about revival, is it? What is revival? Well, revival, as commonly understood, is when the church is revived and when Tremendous things are happening evangelistically and thousands are coming into the kingdom from all over the place. That's a time of revival, the sort of thing they had in the Hebrides many years ago, the kind of thing they had in Rwanda, the kind of thing we've had here from time to time through the centuries. Revival! Hallelujah! This isn't describing revival, but it is describing something truly wonderful. And what is that? This Gospel, this good news of the kingdom, will be proclaimed in the whole world as a testimony to all nations. It's not describing revival, but it is describing the mighty demonstration 
of the gospel of the kingdom through faithful disciples of Jesus all over the world. All over the world, people like us getting up off our bottoms, if you'll forgive the indelicacy, and proclaiming the gospel. But notice, it is the gospel of what? The gospel of the kingdom. And you may say, well, that's the gospel, surely. Well, then why does Matthew say the gospel of the kingdom as being what Jesus said? Because this is what Jesus said, this gospel of the kingdom. You see, we have to reckon that the gospel has to do with the king. It has to do with the rule and reign of Jesus. This is not simply a question of saying, come to Jesus and all your problems will be solved. No, it's not even a question of saying, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. There's something more. It is the gospel of the, of the kingdom where Jesus is utterly, absolutely, unquestionably Lord and King. See, that's the gospel. Now, just turn quickly to the first preaching of the gospel by a disciple of Jesus. It could only happen when the Holy Spirit had come upon them and filled them with power. They couldn't preach the gospel before. And so where is the first preaching of the gospel? And it is in Acts chapter 2. And we're going to go there after we've had a break in a minute. But I just want you to look briefly at the last verse of Peter's sermon. You'll remember this was a great occasion. It was a, a Jewish feast. What was the Jewish feast? The feast of Pentecost, wasn't it? The Feast of Pentecost, the second of the pilgrim feasts. You've got Passover and Pentecost, and then in the autumn we've got the Feast of Tabernacles. Wonderful things. Great, rich seams of teaching for us to mine. Fantastic stuff. And the Feasts of the Lord are prophetic in the way they speak of the Lord Jesus. Passover, Pentecost about what he's done for us. Tabernacles speaking very much about his coming as the Messiah. So two concerning past events, if you will, and one concerning future events. And there are other festivals too, but of the three pilgrim feasts, this is the second, the Feast of Pentecost. Interesting, you ask a Christian what the Feast of Pentecost is all about and what will he say? Is what? Coming of the Holy Spirit. We'd agree with that, wouldn't we? Anybody disagree with that? Well, you're being very silent if you do. <laughs> I do. <laughs> it's not the whole story, is it? Oh, well done. So you ask a Jewish person what's Pentecost about, Shavuot, and he'll say, it's the giving of the law at Mount Sinai, Mount Horeb. That's interesting. So it's the festival of the word, the written word at that. And for us, the festival of the coming of the Holy Spirit. But you see, the Holy Spirit came on the festival of the word. Now, if you don't think that's significant, I'll be very surprised. Of course it's significant. Because constantly, through the scriptures, we have this interplay between the Holy Spirit and the Word of God. The Word, the Spirit. The Spirit, the Word. Even from Genesis 1. You can't go back any earlier than that. And in Genesis 1, we have the astonishing account of the creation of the cosmos. The creation. The created order springing into being. How come? Well, Moses tells us, if you'd like to just turn back to Genesis 1, I just want to encourage you with this so that you can see I'm not making it up. Genesis chapter 1, this is the foundation statement of the entire written revelation of God's Word. In the beginning. You can't get any earlier than that. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Now the earth was formless and empty, 
darkness was over the surface of the deep. And the Spirit of God was hovering over the waters. Oh, praise God. All right. Now we know how the earth came into being. The Holy Spirit was there. And because the Holy Spirit was there, anything and everything could happen. The world came into being. Not quite. The Spirit of God was hovering over the waters and God said, Let there be light. And there was light. Hallelujah. In consequence of what? The Word of God and the Spirit of God flowing together in glorious harmony and the power of God was released. See, that is an important thing because it's telling us how God created the world. By his word and by his spirit. By his spirit and by his word. Now, this is a critically important thing. And if you care to look at uh, the book of Psalms, Ah, uh, now, yes, there we are, Psalm 33. <clears throat> Sing joyfully to the Lord, you righteous. That's you and me, hopefully. And we've been doing just that, haven't we? It is fitting for the upright to praise him. Praise the Lord with the harp. Make music to him on the ten-stringed lyre. Now, notice those two lines in verse 2. Praise the Lord with the harp. Make music on, to him on the ten-stringed lyre. Look at those two lines. Are they saying the same thing or are they saying different things? Praise the Lord with the harp. Make music to him on the ten-stringed lyre. Is that a repeat of the same thing? It is, isn't it? It's a repeat, but it's different. Praise the Lord with the harp. Make music to him on the ten-stringed lyre. That's called parallelism. Sorry to be tedious and boring, but it's interesting to me. It's a Hebrew way of writing poetry. If you look at the Psalms, they don't rhyme, do they? And some people would say, oh, they're not very good poems because they don't rhyme. Well, that's because they're Hebrew poems and not English poems. And Hebrew poems are judged by different criteria. And one of them is what's called parallelism. It's a very skillful thing. And here's a good example. It's exactly the same statement, but slightly different for emphasis, you see. Praise the Lord, that's matched with Make music to him. Do you see that? You look at those two lines. Praise the Lord. That's matched with make music to him. With the harp. What's that matched with? On the ten-stringed lyre. Can you see how they're parallel to one another? They're making the same statement in slightly different ways. Now, look again. We go on a little bit further. Sing to him a new song. Play skillfully and shout for joy. For the word of the Lord is right and true. He's faithful in all he does. The Lord loves righteousness and justice. The earth is full of his unfailing love. Now look at verse 6. Here's another parallelism. By the word of the Lord were the heavens made. Their starry host by the breath of his mouth. Now, you may have a clue there with the word breath. How is that Hebrew word normally translated in the Hebrew Scriptures? Spirit. Spirit. So, another way of reading this then, and perfectly legitimate, would be to say, by the word of the Lord were the heavens made, their starry host, the heavens in other words, their starry host, by the breath, the spirit, the breath of his mouth. Now, can you see the same thing again? The word of the Lord is paralleled in their starry host. Or rather, it isn't, is it? What's it paralleled in? The word of the Lord. What's the parallel in the second line? The breath of, the breath of his mouth. Well done. 
were the heavens made is paralleled in the first part of the second line, their starry host. Now, I hope you're not confused by what I'm saying, but this is really important. It's another parallelism, but it's been reversed. But it's making this incredible point. When God created the stars in the heavens, how did he do it? According to that verse. What does it say? In the first line, it is what? And in the second line, the breath of his mouth. See the same thing again? Word, spirit. Spirit, word. Now, you'll detect this all the way through the scriptures. This is one of the great principles we need to understand. How is the power of God released? When his word and his spirit are fused together. Not the one or the other. The true power of God is only released when his spirit and his word are flowing together. Now that brings us straight into Acts chapter 2. <clears throat> Acts chapter 2 is on the feast of Pentecost, and you now know that Pentecost is to the Jewish people the festival of the what? The giving of the word, the giving of the law. Right. So what were all these thousands of Jewish pilgrims doing in Jerusalem, they were celebrating the giving of the written word of God. That's what they were doing on the Feast of Pentecost. And as you know, there were thousands and tens of thousands, indeed some scholars say hundreds of thousands of Jewish pilgrims here in the Temple Mount. You say, how do you, believe, how do you know it's the Temple Mount? Well, let's see what it says. When the day of Pentecost came, they were all together in one place. That word place is often used in the scriptures of the temple. Suddenly a sound like the blowing of a violent wind came from heaven and filled the whole house where they were sitting. Father's house is a word, the, the word is used of the temple. So this did not happen in some back street in Jerusalem when the Holy Spirit fell. We're talking the Temple Mount. And at nine o'clock in the morning, which is when this was, how do we know that? How familiar, familiar are you with this? It tells us what time it was, doesn't it? What does it say in chapter 2, verse 14? Peter said, fellow Jews and all of you who live in Jerusalem, let me explain this to you. Listen carefully to what I say. These men are not drunk as you suppose. It's only nine in the morning. Nine o'clock in the morning was the time of the morning sacrifice on the Feast of Pentecost. What were they doing? Hundreds of thousands of them crammed into the Temple Mount on the morning of Pentecost at nine o'clock when the morning sacrifice, the smoke was drifting up off the altar, what were they doing? They were high praising God for the giving of his word, blessing the Lord for his written word. How amazing is that? That's what they were doing. Now I think that's really significant, don't you? At what time of day was it when the Lord sent his Holy Spirit out of heaven. What time was it? Nine o'clock in the morning. So while they were praising God for his written word, out of heaven poured the Holy Spirit onto and into the apostles. And they immediately began to minister first thing Peter did was to proclaim the word. Why? Word, spirit, power. And there you see this consistency throughout the scriptures. What a remarkable thing. Peter stands up with the eleven, raises his voice and addresses the crowd. Fellow Jews, and all of you who live in Jerusalem, let me explain this to you. Explain what? explain the baptism in the Holy Spirit, which is what had just taken place. Now you can imagine all these pilgrims. 
See, we're talking a huge gathering because it's been estimated that on the Temple Mount in Jerusalem, you can fit Windsor Castle three times. That's pretty big. Today, as you know, that whole area is under the jurisdiction of the Muslims. But when they have a major festival and there are Muslim pilgrims on the Temple Mount in Jerusalem, they estimate you can get a million up there. Now, we're going back 2,000 years. Forget the Muslims. We're talking about Jews. Come from all over the world of that time. They were, as you know, in little Jewish colonies in all the great cultural population centers of the world. Huge colonies of them. I mean, in a place like Alexandria in Egypt, they built a new synagogue there. It was so big that people sitting at the back or standing at the back couldn't hear the activity at the front. They couldn't hear it. It was such a huge building and the leaders of the service, the synagogue service at the front, had to adopt a semaphore system to show people what was going on at the front because they couldn't hear from the back. It was a vast place. Why? Needed to be because of the hugeness of the colony of Jewish people living there. And that was reproduced in Ephesus, in Rome, all over the Roman Empire. Colonies of Jewish people. And the pilgrim feasts required Jewish people to come up to Jerusalem if it was humanly possible, and for thousands it was humanly possible, and they did. So we're talking a vast crowd of people. And Peter stands up and addresses them. And he needs to, because they have heard this mighty, rushing, roaring wind from heaven. They've seen the tongues of fire appearing on the apostles and immediately heard them speaking in their languages from all over the world. They heard them supernaturally gifted, speaking in tongues, recognizable languages. How come we all hear in our own languages the glorious things of God? High praise of the Lord. That's one of the wonderful uses of the gift of tongues, isn't it? How wonderful it is. Praise the Lord for that. But you see, they were consciously hearing the wondrous works of God through the apostles. And they were understandably pretty scared. That's why Peter needs to reassure them. Let me explain this to you. Listen carefully to what I say. These men are not drunk, as you suppose. It's only nine in the morning. Now, I don't know whether part of the reason for saying that was, how could they be drunk? The pubs aren't open yet. I don't know. That's possible, I suppose. But it is so important to recognize exactly what time this occurred. It occurred when the sacrifice was being offered in praise and thanksgiving for the written word of God. Then he goes on to say, no, this is what was spoken by the prophet Joel. In the last days, God says, I'll pour out my spirit on all people. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your young men will see visions. Your old men will dream dreams. Even on my servants, both men and women, I'll pour out my spirit in those days and they'll prophesy. I'll show wonders in the heaven above and signs on the earth below. Blood and fire and billows of smoke the sun will be turned to darkness and the moon to blood before the great, the coming of the great and glorious day of the Lord. And everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Hallelujah. What a wonderful thing. And so this is Peter reassuring them from the written word of God that what they've witnessed is entirely kosher. It is entirely according to the written scriptures. And he uses that remarkable prophecy of Joel in order to authenticate what they are seeing with their eyes and hearing with their ears. It is a most remarkable thing. But you see how the Holy Spirit has given him this understanding. This is that. This is what was happening. And he's able to express it in prophetic terms from the book of Joel. It is simply wonderful. 
But then it goes on in a different vein. And this is what I want to share with you because this is talking about the gospel of the kingdom. What is the gospel of the kingdom? Well, the gospel of the kingdom is the good news of the king and his rule and reign. Just let me confirm this before we have a break. The last verse, 36, which is the last statement of his preaching, this great evangelistic sermon, which he's about to share. Therefore, bear in mind, he's preaching with a view to seeing people respond to the gospel. So we want to make it as easy as possible, don't we? That's what we do as evangelists. We uh, want to make it as easy as possible. Don't make it tough. Don't make it difficult. Make it simple. Make it easy to receive. Sadly, that's not what Peter does. He seems to take another angle. He seems to want to say to them, I don't care how difficult you find it to receive this. This is the gospel. This is the truth. This is the way to be saved. Let all Israel, verse 36, be assured of this, God has made this Jesus, whom you crucified, Lord and Messiah. Now, there's a statement and a half. God has made this Jesus, whom you crucified, both Lord and Messiah. He's the Lord. It's a Terrific term, kurios in Greek. The word is Lord, absolute lordship is what we're talking about. Nothing relative about this. God has made him Lord. You see? God has made him Lord. God has made him Messiah. It's all God's initiative. Hallelujah. He's the King of Kings. He's the great high priest. The great high priest who would allow himself to be sacrificed by God the Father for the sins of the whole world. God's doing. But he's Lord and he's Messiah. But he's that because of God. God has made him Lord and great high priest and King of Kings. I don't know whether you've ever heard a, a preacher say something like this to you. Do you remember there was a day in your life when you gave your life to Christ? You accepted him as your saviour, hallelujah. But you see, if you are really going to be truly a disciple of Jesus, you have to acknowledge him, acknowledge him as your Lord. This you must do. Well, I've got news for you. You don't need to do that. Why? God has already done it. God the Father, the mighty sovereign creator of the universe, he has made this Jesus, he has made this Jesus both Lord and Messiah, King of kings. Great high priest, God has done it. You're not consulted. He is Lord and King. He is because God has ordained it. He is, God has established it. Not he will be when he comes again. He is Lord and Messiah. He is. Now you see, that's very good news. But it's also extremely bad news. It's good news for you. Why? Because you have bowed the knee to King Jesus. You are kingdom people. But what about the millions out there who are still without Christ? Does it mean that Jesus is not Lord of their life? Oh no, it doesn't mean that at all. He is Lord of their life. How come? God's made him Lord. He's not just Lord of Christians. He's Lord of the whole earth. Hallelujah. But if you are not living 
under the lordship and kingship of Jesus, you are in rebellion against that kingship. That's bad news. And if our gospel does not start with the bad news and then go on to talk about the good news, we're selling the people short, but so many evangelistic sermons do not include the aspect of the utter supremacy and lordship and kingship of our blessed Lord. It does not figure. And because it does not figure, it is not truly the biblical gospel. It is a truncated version. And there are, sad to say, people around who have received that truncated version of the gospel. They have never put Jesus in his rightful place. They make no attempt to keep him in his rightful place. He is Lord. He is King. We are kingdom people. We're not just church people. We're not pew fodder. We are disciples of Jesus Christ. And a disciple is someone who has established utterly, absolutely, that Jesus is the king of their life. And they are determined to live and to serve his kingdom and only his kingdom. Now this is a very difficult thing. And I'm laboring it because you're who you are. But we need always to bear in mind when we're telling people about Jesus and the way to be saved, it is the gospel of the kingdom. And that's what Peter proclaimed. Why am I spending time on this? Well, because I believe the Lord has asked me to do so. But what I want to do is to be able to show you what the biblical gospel truly is so that you are equipped to share it with people. Why do you need to be so equipped? Well, because Jesus says, before the end comes, this gospel of the kingdom will be proclaimed through the whole earth. Who by? I'm looking at the answer to the question. And so are you. The thing is, though, you see, when a preacher says to you, we ought to be out there preaching the gospel, proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom. I'm sure you'll agree with me that you can sometimes leave that church building feeling as if, as if you've just been flogged. <laughs> Why? Because you do not know how to do it. And you are riddled with guilt. It's all very well, Mr. Preacher, to tell me we need to be proclaiming the good news. It's all very well you telling me that this is what Jesus says in Matthew 24. But I don't know how. I'd love to do it. I don't know how. Now, that's a genuine thing. And there are thousands like that. They'd love to do it, but they don't know how. How do we do it? Well, I've really got some good news for you because I... Believe the Lord is telling me to tell you this is how. How? Biblically. And we're going to use this amazing chapter because it is the first mention of the preaching of the gospel. Now you'll say to me, well, yeah, but you see, you're, this is Jewish, isn't it? This is all Jews. Every person on that temple mount that day who heard the gospel from Peter was Jewish. Four marks, well done. That's exactly correct. But that does not mean there's a different gospel for non-Jews. Because this is the first mention of the proclamation of the gospel. The first mention. We've been referring to certain Hebrew principles for understanding the scriptures. One is the principle of first mention. This is the first mention of the gospel. It is therefore going to be a keynote statement for every other reference to the gospel. It is a critical passage. And we're going to have a look at it to see what it has to say. But before we do that, I think you've earned a break. I know I have. So we'll take a, what should we say, 15 minutes? 